Hey everybody, this is Mike from Chris and Mike. Uh, Chris isn't going to join us for uh, this video. Um, we've been getting a lot of requests on uh, doing a video on crime in Ecuador. Something we've put off and really didn't want to do until we were here longer and knew more about it and did lots of research. Um, so we're at that point now and um, today is uh, May 21st and I prepared all the information that you're going to see um, over the last few days uh, but it's a little different uh, this time because um, there was a, a major um, killings in Montanita last night uh, which is extremely unfortunate um, it's uh, just uh, seven kilometers from where we live and it was in a restaurant and it wasn't even late at night it was uh, somewhere around nine o'clock uh, 8 30 9 o'clock at night and uh, six people were killed and uh, it makes you look at things um, differently when it's happening literally in your in your backyard um, you know it's kind of like when a when uh, you know a plane crashes uh, in your country or or in your city you look at it very very differently than a plane uh, you know crash crashing in India or Pakistan or something or another part of the world um, but it's happening here and uh, crime is real here uh, and in this video we're gonna look at uh, all the data and uh, see what the data tells us and uh, we're certainly not going to sensationalize any of this um, and uh, we're just going to look at what uh, I've been uh, able to find what the facts are. Um, so uh, stay tuned and uh, let's get to it right after this. You liking this one, Chris? Here's Chris having some lemonades. <laughs> okay, let's get started. If you look at this uh, chart, it shows Ecuador's homicide rate as of uh, 2022, and it's actually 25.9 homicides per 100,000. So this per 100,000 population is used all around the world so that we can compare homicide rates. So we'll be talking about those homicides per 100,000 uh, for the rest of this presentation. So here's another graph um, showing the same, same chart. Um, as you can see, the 2022 is up uh, over the 25. This graph goes for a longer period of time. And you can see for many years, starting at 2000, Ecuador was around, you know, 15 to 20. And then as we get into 2016, 2015, 2018, 2019, it really lowered uh, around about five, which is, which is just excellent. Um, and then obviously has gone up starting in about 2020, the last three years. And with all predictions with how 2023 is shaping up, this will indeed be higher, probably above 30. Um, what's interesting, and some of these numbers are a little different depending on where you source it, uh, but the trend is exactly the same. So the vast majority, majority of the uh, homicides are... Um, uh, cartel related here they're saying uh, you know 90 percent but really most is sort of around anywhere from 70 to 90 percent um, the vast majority majority of it um, is in that category and that's what's important um, as we move forward and sort of look at some of these charts now this chart shows where in ecuador these homicides are happening and you can see um, the red areas uh Almost all of them are on the coast, and most of them are in big cities on the coast. So, you know, Monta, Guayaquil, Esmeralda, um, and in Santa Elena is spared a little bit, but that's only because the population is much less compared to the other areas. Now, there's a reason why most of these homicides are happening on the coast, and that is, uh, since we now know most of the 
homicides are drug cartel related, you could see most of the paths of getting the drugs out of Ecuador. And where are they going? They're mostly going to uh, Europe, um, Mexico, uh, United States, sometimes via uh, Colombia and, uh, and Peru. And you can see Guayaquil is a major area, but all along the all along the coast, whether it's planes, boats, um, and it's all the way up. And that's a problem. So let's now compare again within Ecuador. We're back using our homicides per hundred thousand, and you can see that uh, and this is all 2022 data, and you can see the global average where it fits and you can see that in relative terms uh, Quito and Cuenca are pretty much at the global average um, and they have much less um, homicides per hundred thousand and you can see the coast is really where the issue is Esmeraldas is, is about the province here Manta that includes the other ones within Manabe but most of them are are in the Manta area and uh, Guayaquil. The other thing I want to point out is that when you drill down within Esmeraldas, Monta, and especially Guayaquil, uh, and Monta for that matter, is there's specific neighborhoods where over 70% of the issues are just those neighborhoods. There are many safe areas. In fact, the majority of areas are safe, especially in Monta and to some extent Guayaquil as well, where the rates are very, very low. I just didn't have enough accurate information to be able to show a slide on that. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to note is that there's 65 cities in the United States that have a homicide rate of greater than 11. Um, and that shows the 11 here per 100,000. But you'll see some of those cities in a minute that will be in this area up here out of those 65. One of the important things to do is to be able to look at this from a relative point of view so that we can compare. Uh, because the media sometimes blows things, or not sometimes, almost all the time, uh, blows things out of proportion. So we need to be able to look at things from a logical point of view and be able to compare um, our experiences to other parts of the world. Um, so you can see here on the left, there's Ecuador's current rate, there's the U.S. current rate, and there's the Canada current rate on um, homicides, murders per 100,000 people. And then you can look at particular areas, just like we looked at Guayaquil and Monta uh, and Esmeraldas in Ecuador as places that were particularly bad, and Cuenca and uh, uh, Quito, um, large areas that were that were fine, really, in all intents and purposes. So when we compare, um, and what's kind of shocking here is that you know New Orleans is is so so high. Um, and we look at a place where most people wouldn't think twice about visiting Las Vegas um, for for holidays and, uh, you know, going to the different shows and things. And, and they have a rate that is higher than uh, than Ecuador. Um, now, on the Canadian side, the three highest in Canada are uh, Thunder Bay, Regina and Winnipeg. Um, and you can see where they sort of fit on the map. Again, from a relative point of view, you can look at the uh, top in this particular chart, the top 26 um, cities in the world where there's the highest homicide per 100,000 people. And you can see the homicide rates here with Guayaquil being number 24. But again, and I want to be careful, I'm not trying to minimize it, but it's not all of Guayaquil, it's certain areas. And where there's drug cartels in many of these cities, um, it is generally in specific areas of those cities. Um, when we look at things that are not, uh, we look at violence that's not drug cartel related, they tend to be spread out a little bit more. You're actually more at risk. You may have a lower number of homicides per 100,000, but personally you may be more at risk. 
especially when you look at um, cities in the United States where drug cartels are not the major issue. Um, some of the issues are, are really, you know, mass killings um, and they can happen anywhere in that particular uh, city or state. So let's drill down again for comparison purposes. Let's look at United States. So here's again the homicide rate per 100,000 in the uh, different states. And you can see, depending on where you are, it's dramatically different. If you're looking up in the Northeast, uh, there's areas there that are safer than Canada. Um, and of course, if you look down into, you know, Mississippi, Louisiana, um, you see some of the highest rates. Um, and you can see it's really mixed depending on, on where you are. And within those states, the cities are very much mixed. Um, so you really have to pay attention uh, to the details here as opposed to glossing over and summarizing everything. Because usually the summaries are not accurate as they should be. One of the factors affecting violence around the world, in particular countries, is this um, uh, really curve that you see. Now this one's for England and Wales and it goes back to 2000, but if you do any research, this is valid around the world at really any time period. And it really shows when, and whether it's males or females who are committing violent crimes. And you can see that uh, males, uh, right from about that sort of 15 to 25, 26, um, that's where the majority of crimes get committed. Um, and uh, it's it's a real problem. In fact, in in uh, many uh, places and states and provinces in Ontario and the U.S., a lot of them take credit for falling um, crime rates uh, from their police force. And the police force says, oh, it's because we added so many police officers. Well, in reality, if you dig down and look at the stats, it's really that population of males who are committing the crimes got older and became more responsible as they got families and, and uh, you know, wives. And uh, it's changed the whole thing. And you see that around the world is as the males get older um, and the distribution of um, the population population by age, depending on what that is, that can affect the crime rate. Let me show you a little bit more about that in the next chart. So this chart shows the distribution by age of the population in Ecuador in 2020. And this is very different from the American and Canadian charts where the bulk of the population is much older. Here, the bulk of the population, you can see here, and both males and females in that sort of 15 to 19 to 25 to 29, right when all the crimes are being committed in that area. Now, I'm not saying this is the only factor and this is what it's happening. Um, you know, I don't want to make blanket statements like that. I'm just saying this is another in addition to the drug cartels. And this is, let's face it, this is who the drug cartels take advantage of, of, of disenfranchised youth. Um, and uh, and, and they're there in Ecuador. And in many cases, they're, they're in uh, poverty or at least low income. Now, what should happen, as repeated in many parts of the world, is as this population here gets older and this curve moves up and they start having families, they become generally more responsible. Uh, and you can see what's happening is it's a smaller group that is moving forward. And that should have a positive effect on the crime rate in a minor way, though. Still need to deal with the drug problem in Ecuador. So let's look at where these drugs are being used. Most of the drugs that are leaving South America are going into North America and Europe. This chart shows the death rate from drug use uh, per 100,000. And it's uh, age standardized, which basically meaning we can compare different countries regardless of the age distribution. And you can see the red and the green are the worst areas within the world. And as you can see, Ecuador, um, Colombia, uh, and Mexico really don't have drug use issues. Um, and 
you know, some people may think this is because of, you know, an income level and it really has nothing to do with income. As you can see, there's places in, uh, in Africa that uh, clearly don't have high income but have major uh, drug issues, uh, drug use deaths. And you can see United States by far, followed by Canada and Australia. Like, what's going on here? And I'm not an expert, but there needs to be obviously some studies, and maybe there already are. I haven't read them as to why this phenomenon is happening in, in uh, North America, especially. Because as you move down, you know, the first place you start to see it outside of uh, North America in the Western world is Finland, and Norway, also issues, but but, you know, Canada is double. And again, this is per 100,000 people, so it has nothing to do with population. Or as you can see, all these other countries here, nothing to do with wealth. Um, there's something in particular going on. And being from Canada, I know, uh, you know, the areas where, you know, small town, they had drug issues and people were dying a lot from uh, opioids and fentanyl and those types of things. You see the United States number is uh, virtually as high as the uh, homicide rate in Ecuador. So this is, a, this is a real risk that's happening right now in the United States. In Canada, that number is three times, actually four times, the rate of homicides in Canada. It, it's a huge problem, way more than murders. And, uh, and of course, drug use, um, a lot of smaller crime comes from drug use as they uh, you know, feed their habits. So a lot of break and enter and petty theft come from that. So one of the things that plays into all of this is really the role of the media. And um, the media's changed a lot um, from 20 years ago where, you know, news was news, it tended to have the right perspective on things in the most part, truth was truth. And what happens these days on whether it's social media, whether it's TV stations you're, uh, you are watching or newspapers you are reading, um, it's pretty hard to figure out the truth in many cases, but also um, what all of them are after now is, uh, you know, ratings, whether it's clicks on social media. And uh, so, you know, there's, there's lots of risks in our lives. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit because that's really what this is all about is, is almost doing a risk assessment of, of our lives. You know, the moment you hop in a car and drive on a snowy day, you're taking a particular risk. Um, whether you move into a bad area within a city, um, that's also a risk that you're taking. And all of these risks, one risk is, is not, uh, you know, different from another risk. They all, <laughs> they all can cause your death. Does it really matter whether you were shot or whether you have died from lung cancer because you smoked your whole life? Um, you know, death is death. So um, we need to be able to sort of compare and put things in perspective because the media doesn't help us do that. In fact, they do the opposite. The things that people like to read are, tend to be shocking. It's like, oh, what happened at this particular place? There was a shooting. There was a mugging. You know, my friend, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, killed. Um, those are the types of things that that the media will focus on and those are the types of things that we hear about all the time. But let's look at some charts that talk about other things the media barely uh, touches on on a day-to-day -day basis and we'll see how that fits into this whole picture before we wrap it up. So let's put that violent risk in Ecuador at 25, remember 25.9 per 100,000, at other things, other risks that we have in our lives. So this is from the United States. Canada is very similar. So heart disease, 173.8 out of 100,000. Cancer, 146. Now, some of these we don't have control over, but leading healthy lives can really lower these numbers. Smoking on the cancer side, and on the heart disease side, you know, eating the proper, um, you know, foods, going to doctors on a regular basis, um, you know, unintentional injuries. We're not going to talk about COVID. I think we're all tired <laughs> of talking about COVID and that whole piece. So I'm skipping that right over on this, uh, on this slide. Unintentional injuries are double the uh, 
rate of homicide in Ecuador. And these are basically accidents that can happen to you, uh, especially if you're not careful. You know, stroke. Um, you know, one of the things that's always a concern, uh, you know, that's growing across, uh, you know, countries around the world is is respiratory diseases. Um, you know, diabetes, death from diabetes is the same rate of homicides in Ecuador. And again, I'm not trying to minimize things in Ecuador. I'm looking at it from a logical perspective of the different types of risk that affects your life and how many of them you need to be able to manage. Um, so it's not all about, you know, where you're living. Uh, and violence is not the number one thing you need to be worrying about. It's it's one thing out of all of these different things. So you, need, you need to be able to look at all of these things and make a decision for yourself on on the lifestyle you want to lead and and that would provide you, you know, the most the most safety in your life, a long fulfilling life. A couple other things I want to mention before I leave this chart is if we look at cancer rates. Cancer rate in Canada is actually slightly higher than the cancer rate in the U.S. Ecuador, significantly well over 10% to 15% lower cancer rate um, the causing death uh, than the U.S. and Canada. Um, on the other hand, traffic accidents. Um, in Ecuador, the traffic accidents are almost at the same rate as homicides. Um, so it's probably not best to rent a car, drive all over the place. Or, and if you want to, that's fine, as long as you accept that uh, risk. Uh, it's at 20.6 per 100,000, whereas the U.S. is at 11.1 .1 deaths per 100,000 and Canada at 4.58. Um, suicide, another one where it's completely different, where in Canada and the U.S. it's much higher. Uh, it's double the suicide rate um, in Ecuador. Um, so there's all kinds of things that you need to be able to look at from a risk, overall risk perspective. So on this last slide, here's a little case study on El Salvador. And, uh, you know, is there hope for Ecuador? Is there hope for any country where the drug cartels take over? Here's an example, um, whether you agree with it or not, um, it actually worked. So if we look at, again, this is the same rate, homicide rate per 100,000. And you can see over the years, it sort of fluctuates between, you know, that sort of 40 and 70. And these years were particularly bad um, with the Civil War. But you can see there's a dramatic improvement starting in 2020 from 2019 and then down to 2022. And that's really all about the new president who basically uh, threw away uh, civil rights and rounded up all of the drug cartel people and put them all in prison without due process. So it worked. <laughs> they obviously also threw in jail a lot of innocent people, but they captured the vast majority, if not all, of the drug uh, cartel gangs and uh, put them all in jail. And now this past year in 2022 was down to 7.8, which is just you know, never in the history of El Salvador. And you can read articles about people who are now wandering neighborhoods they've never wandered before. So everybody, that sort of wraps up uh, this week's uh, video. Hopefully you found it uh, informative. Um, you know, how does it affect Chris and I? Uh, you know, are we staying in Ecuador? Is this really causing us a huge amount of concern? Um, certainly we are concerned, absolutely, and we're watching it. And that's why, you know, a lot of that research I had to do for myself, uh, just so I could understand everything better and to look at overall risk uh, as opposed to just risk from, from violence. And uh, the other thing is if you watched our, our video on the five reasons we've moved to Ecuador, each of those reasons um, we actually underestimated. We are in heaven here and we're loving it. And uh, you know this uh, crime thing is certainly one of the negatives, especially the trend is very concerning. But when Chris and I look at the overall picture um, and our specific lives, uh, we're extremely 
extremely happy here. Uh, but that's just us, and you need to make your own decision on whether you still want to come here if you're not here yet, or if you're here. Is this really affecting you and causing you a lot of distress, and, and maybe you do need to leave? These are all sort of individual decisions. And what I tried to do was, was put more valid information into the dialogue and your decision-making uh, process. And hopefully I didn't uh, bore you too much. Anyway, remember guys, live the life you love, whatever it is. Take care. Till next time.